Welcome everyone to this talk hosted by the Buddha Dharma Mandala Society. Today our topic is how we create our virtual world. And our speaker is Dr. Lee Fung Ming. First, a little um, bio data about Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee Ming Fung Ming graduated from National University of Singapore and continued her postgraduate studies in the University of Kalania, Sri Lanka. She specializes in Saravastiwada Abhidharma and received her PhD degree in 2003. Dr. Lee currently teaches history of Buddhism and Abhidharma at the Buddhist College of Singapore. She also conducts regular annual meditation courses. Okay, without much further ado, Dr. Lee. Okay, where do I see myself? <laughs> Can I just share screen first, okay? Okay, can all of you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so today I'm going to do a Hannibal discourse, which uh, I think Sister Sylvia Bay has done with you last May. Uh, so most of you would have some idea about what Hannibal discourse is all about. And Sister Bay has done very good uh, text studies, textual studies. So I'm not going to go into the text again. What I want to discuss about is how we can apply Madhupindika in our daily life. A little bit also about how uh, it helps us in our practice, meditation practice, and how we can uh, internalize the meditation, meditation practice into our life again. Okay, So I'm not going to do really chin uh, textual studies because you have done that already. So we're just going to plunge straight into the story of Madhupindika. What is Madhupindika? Uh, just to jerk your memory a bit, and I hope you all, all of you remember what is Madhupindika. It is actually the name of a scripture, and it comes from Majjhima Dikaya, Sutta number 18. Okay, This is one of my favorite suttas because it teaches us so much about what is going on in our mind. Yeah. And the background story, can you remember the young Shakya youth who say, said hello to the Buddha and then asked him what he actually taught? But in the end, he didn't really show a lot of interest in the Buddha's teachings and he just went away, you know, much like a lot of youngsters now listening to what us old folks had to say. And then they'll say, okay, anyway, what else, whatever. And then they just walk off. Okay, so probably this youth in the Madhupindika story was also like that, you know. But the Buddha actually brought this uh, story back to the Sangha and used it as a teaching point. So he shared what he has told the, the, the youngster, the, the bhikkhus. And luckily for us, one of the bhikkhus actually asked the Buddha to elaborate on uh, his answers. Okay, but before we go on to the chin part, remember what Sister Bay has shared with you, the chimology part, the, the one about well, the Sanya and Sankara. Okay, so before I went on to go on to that part, I would really love to invite uh, Brother Julian to share with us his very nice uh, presentation in, in diagram about uh, the perceptual process. So... Brother Julian, please share your screen and share your knowledge okay. with us. Um, wow, look at this, look at this. They say a picture paints a thousand words, so yeah. I just try to use a pictorial uh, presentation. In, um, this explains to us how our eyes sees the world. In this case, uh, this, uh, this rose, right? Okay, there are two ways we can see the rose. Huh? One is we are looking uh, searching for the roast, all right? So from the eye here, we, we look outwards and we see the roast, all right? The other way is we are not looking for the roast, but it happened that the roast is, you know, as we walk along, it came into our sight. So this is the process, all right? But all this is only possible if there is attention being paid. For example, let's say uh, your friend is at the bus stop and then he's waving at you, but uh, you're thinking of something else and you don't see your friend. She goes to the bus window and she hits it. <laughs> Suddenly you're jotted, oh, you look. So attention is there. And that's why from there arises what is called eye consciousness. Now, according to the suttas, all the amalgamation of all these four processes, huh, okay, will arise what's called eye contact. And if you read the sutta, it says, 
with eye contact arises feelings. And what one feels, one perceives. What one perceives, one thinks about. And what one thinks about, one proliferates. Okay? And notion arises from this with regards to the past, the present, and also the future. And the thing is that in Chinese, it's called si lun, zhou hi ya. Oh, from here, we are prompt to act, okay, in terms of volitional formation. And once volitional formation comes in, there is a becoming, all right? And feelings is always pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, okay? And from here, volitional formation comes in the form of body, speech, and mind. And from here, because volitional formation is also karma. Therefore, there is, in the Chinese says, zhao ye kan shen si. Okay, and this is how we perceive the world and how our, in perceiving this world, okay, we have uh, actions and action has results. And this is the whole process of how we perceive. Thank you, I have finished my presentation. <laughs> and that's the whole process of suffering coming in, right? Okay, right. because when the Buddha talks about uh, the Maduk, uh, the Samuprada, he would always end with Chen Da Ku Chi. Right, okay, this part. Can you see my screen now? Sorry for the de uh, delay. Okay, so the chin part. <laughs> Brother Julian has given a very nice summary, okay, of Maduk Pindaka and also combine it with our Patricia uh, Samuel father. So let's go back to Honeyball proper. So after listening to the Buddhist discourse, right, the Bhikkhu asked the Buddha, but Venerable Sir, again, I'm using Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, translation. What is the teaching that the Blessed One asserts whereby one does not quarrel with anyone in the world? This one is very, uh, how do I say, uh, very down to earth, mundane, everyday life, this part of the question. It's the second part of the question that is a bit chin, right? It's about how we actually uh, be detached from all these perceptions and attain nibbana, really. So these two parts of the question that the people ask. And then to this um, good questions, the Buddha had a more chin answer, okay? Uh, I think Sister Sylvia had gone through this with you. We're just going to run through this to judge your memory, okay? Because the Buddha says, because as to the source through which perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation to set a man, if nothing is found there to delight in, welcome, and hold to, this is the end of underlying tendency to last aversion, abuse, doubt, sit, conceit, desire for being inherent. This is the end of resorting to rocks and weapons, quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malice, and false speech. Here, yeah, these evil unwholesome states these without remainder. Uh, I think if you have remembered Sister Silva Day, um, I think she had been uh, repeating the things, to, nothing to delight in, to welcome to, right? So this part of the teaching should cling on to, I mean, should be in your memory. So I'm not going to go through this and just, just, just briefly remind you. So what actually, was Buddha talking about is that if we, there's nothing we find we like in, then there is no attachment. One that first step, right? Immediately, I, I was reminded of Xin Jing, <laughs> the Xin Wu Gua Ai. Our brother Julian will also uh, recognize that. Then, when there is no attachment, there will be no mental afflictions. Now, in Xin Jing, we have Wu Gua Gu Wu Yu Kong Bu Yuan Li Dian Dao Meng Xiang. Kong Bu is one of the mental afflictions. Okay, then Dao is the Prabhupada, also Kinch with Ragadosa Moha. So these are mental afflictions as well. And Meng Xiang would be our, uh, our own imaginations, our own thoughts. Okay, so all these are tinged with mental afflictions. That's how we create the whole virtual world within us. As later on, I'm going to show you in Madhukindika how Mahagajana showed us what we have what we do to all these uh, outside data. So when there is no mental affliction, there will be no quarrels, fights and wars. This is one question I'd like to ask you later on. How does it link up when there is no mental affliction, there will be no quarrels, fights and wars. Okay, now Buddhism is a thinking religion. 
we don't we don't just sit there passively listen learn remember memorize that's it okay it's a it's a religion for the intelligent one bante used to tell us that so we have to after listening we have to think remove think about it and then internalize it and then use it in our daily life okay so that's why i i would like very much to listen to you later on you share with me how madhupindika okay how would you explain with no mental afflictions then we won't have quarrels and so what if we don't have quarrels and fights so what okay so that's how we would let madhupindika relate to our daily life i, I want you to think about all these two so we are going to mahagajayana's explanation okay in seven parts now madhupindika is really long so uh professor karuna dasa one of my professors at in sri lanka okay he happened to teach us madhupindika too and i think his explanation he's freaking up of mahagajayana's explanation into seven parts was really really helpful so i'm going to share his teachings with you okay he did that work So the first part was this sentence in the sutra. Chakum jau so patija rupe cha upachati chakum binya na. This was what uh, Brother Julian has shown us just now. The eye, the rose, <laughs> said, depending on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. Okay, so. Now this part is what professor explains to us because of i material objects visual consciousness arises this one is very basic everybody will understand right so the second part comes in jinang sangati passo the meeting of the three is called contact this one brother julian has also touched on with his diagram just now the Uh, professor said is the meeting of the three essential impingement so now my question is three here refers to xianlan can you can you tell me the answer what is the three here when the sutta said the meeting of the three is contact so what does it mean by the three here i guess all of us know lah ha huh? just pulling out giving you a chance to tell me Teach me, le. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, um. I'm Sister Annie. Hi, Sister Annie. Thank you. Uh, yes. The three um, is. Three is one is the eye. Yeah. It means the sense organ. The other one is the object. Yeah. That you see. Uh huh. Uh, you haven't seen it yet, but there's the eye, and then there's the object. Yeah. But if your consciousness or your attention is also there, then together is three. Nice. Thank you, Sister Annie. Yeah. So the three here in this honey ball sutta, it was what the Buddha mentioned just now. See, eye forms and eye consciousness. Okay, so these are the three. The meeting of the three. So eye form and eye consciousness. These the meeting of these coming together of these three is called contact pasto. Later on, I'll mention that there are two types of contact. One sensual impingement, what we call a uh, particular sampasa. Okay, another one is actually vaccination contact. Okay, so then the third stage will be with contact as condition. There is feeling. Now, Br- brother Julia also mentioned that okay? all of us, if we have studied a particular sampasa, we know this. Okay, pasta pachaya vedana. Okay, and professor said, conditioned by sensual impingement, feeling arises. Now there are three types of feelings. Brother Julia, Julian has also shown us in his diagram, which is, which are agreeable feelings, disagreeable or neutral feeling. Okay, now this feeling is more properly translated, I think, as sensation. It is not the feelings that uh, Linked to emotion, like I'm happy, I'm very angry, I'm mad. No, this is just a very direct uh, response to the outside external data. Okay, let's say you you look at rose. If you're a rose lover, you have agreeable sensation. If you if you don't like roses, you think ah, this is a horrible flower. Or if you are neutral, you don't like flowers or do not plants. A rose is just a rose to you. you. Don't have any feeling of of happiness or 
need of agreeable or disagreeable sensation within you. Okay, so just have this in mind. The feelings here state that we don't want to be misled by English translation. So usually we just leave it as we and are. We will have to tell the students the feelings here are not emotions. It's just direct response of how we feel when we come in contact with the sense data. And then the fourth state will be well, what one feels that one perceives. Yang bede di sanjanati. So Professor, oh, the string part comes. <laughs> Professor said the noun sanja, the noun of sanjanati is sanya, which all know, right? Sanya is perception. Now, what are perceptions? In modern term, we will just say they are labels. Perceptions are things like big, small, man, woman, cold, hot. All these are labels. Okay, that we shorthand that we give to sense data that comes to us. Okay, for example, I look at Brother Julian and immediately his name, Julian, comes up. That itself is also a label, a sanya, a perception. Uh, using language, we give a shorthand to whatever that comes in contact with us. And so you know that this is a more complex process than vinyana. Okay? Vinyana is just sensual perception. Yet, when you come to Sanya, it's already a higher uh, mental activity than just see, uh, sensing. Okay, so Professor said, ah, it is at this stage okay, that uh, we have this involvement with language. And the object now becomes more confined by our labels. Why is that so? Say, I have always had very good uh, experience with Brother Julian. So when I say Julian, what comes to my mind will be nice sensation, nice uh, things about Julian. But is that the full Julian? <laughs> we, there is a devil in us too. Right? <laughs> but because of all my past good uh, experiences with Julian, and I give that a shorthand, Julian. Okay, And in, in within Julian, this shorthand or this label, I know that He's a man, he's a good Buddhist, he is a, a, a very intellectual person, all the nice things about him. So I confine Julian, this person, to this group of nice things only. But as Julian had told me, he nodded his head, this is not all that he's all about, he's about, right? So, so what we are trying to say is once you start to use Sanya labels involving language, we are confining the reality of our sense data. We begin to confine it to our experience already. Okay, so the fourth, fifth stage. What one perceives, that one reasons about. Yang sanjana di tang di Now, Professor comes up with something chill again. He, he explains to us, he said, okay, look, when one reasons about it, and what do you mean by reason about it? It's like you start to interpret, you start to understand the central data the way we want to understand. So he says, you start to have conceptual knowledge. And he, he explains to us what the taketi is. He said, it's some kind of mental murmuring, psychological dialogue. And when I say, yeah, Julian, mm, Julian, nice guy. Mm, Julian will, will, will help me. Julian isn't that. Okay? So a perception at the taketi level, uh, Perception, just seeing Julian, is no longer just seeing. It becomes a concept already. Julian becomes a concept to me. Okay, the concept is nice guy, intellectual guy, good this blah, 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 blah. You see that or not? So it's not the neutral Julian that I'm seeing. Okay. So, and then you, what you perceive, you start to reason about too. And then the, the, the very subtle mental memory is, Self justification. Ah, I see, Julian smiles at me. Confirm, good guy. Okay. Uh, even if he if he does if he doesn't smile at me, I can sense the friendliness in him. You start to have this kind of self justification when when you have this mental moment. Most of the time, of course, some of you will say, "Don't have lay." <laughs> okay, don't have lay. Maybe with this because it's so subtle, or maybe it's because yeah, I really don't have certain times. That when you go deeper into the uh, 
a perception. You probably, or you have a longer time to, to do perception. You probably have all these stages coming in already. Okay. Then, yang ditake di tang papang jadi. Yes, very scary. When, what one reason is about. Now, one mentally proliferates. Now, the puncture immediately in Chinese, we say si run. So, what actually is si run? It's not just in si only. Okay, it is a whole lot of past stories that you put into what you perceive now. Okay, to justify, to reinterpret your experience now. So, again, a professor explains to us what's the He said it is to expand, to interpret further. So, Papangcha is the noun of Papangche. The Sanskrit is Prapangcha. Okay, another word for Papangcha in our Pali language is Kapana. Kapana. Kapana is a synthetic experience of mind based on our previous perception. And then you interpret with the new data now. And then all these data, they coordinate, link, and you reinterpret. So, all these things involve link language. Now, when you come to language, it's another uh, confined, restricting part because when you think in English and when you think in Chinese and when you think in your whatever language, there is a box, you know, a, a parameter. The way we think in different languages can be different. Okay, let's <laughs> examples like when you say uh, happy. In English, when we say happy, then in Chinese, how would you say happy? We have a whole range of words. Yu kuai, kuai le, yu yue, xing fu, da da da. Even when we watch Korean shows, right? When we hear them say heng bokgu, heng bokka. Okay? Actually, the English translation say, may you be happy. But we know in Chinese, as Koreans do, heng bok means xing fu. Xing fu is not just happy. So can you see the limitations of English or of languages? But when we start using language to label, to think, we again, if we put ourselves in an even smaller box. Just now was Sangya, already there's a label, it's a small box. Now when you think in terms of languages, we are confining ourselves in an even smaller box. Okay, so whatever it is outside the reality that we have come in contact with becomes more and more restricted by our own experience by our own interpretation by our own language use okay so it's very sad right and, and then the links with other stories in our mind okay when i talk think about julian being nice being a good buddhist Somehow I think about people who are not nice, who are not good with this. <laughs> who and then we, I link up and further reinforce. See, you see, that's why Julian is such a good guy. <laughs> you see, or not, it reinforces. I, I don't only think about Julian at this stage. I start to proliferate, start to link further. Link more stories into what I perceive now. Okay? So we are further and further away from truth, don't you think so? Julian is five aggregates. But because I label Julian with from my experience, he becomes just a good Buddhist. And then because I link him up with other stories, he becomes an extraordinarily good Buddhist. You see how the story goes longer and longer and further and further away from truth? Okay. The seventh stage professor had labeled, okay, was ah, this is really long. <laughs> Where, with what one has mentally proliferated a source, perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation to set a man with respect to past, future and present forms cognizable through the eye. I know it's really long, I don't know what he's talking about, <laughs> but the professor has told us. Cut it short. What one proliferates conceptually means to tinge all the connected stories, past, present, future with this new experience. Okay, now I see Julian introducing me in very nice terms. So I say, see, confirm, double confirm, Julian is a good person. Okay, or I'll say, uh, next time Julian will still, because Julian is very friendly with me, next time he will still be friendly. And so we start to have expectations. And in future, one of these days, Julian will fall short of his expectations. And then what's going to happen? 
I'm going to feel disappointed, right? So can you see how we allow ourselves into suffering? Because from all these stories, okay, from the past, I confirm, I double confirm, I am right about Julian. From the present, I interpret Julian's every smile, every gesture as being friendly. And because of that, I expect that in future, Julian will still be so good to me. Okay, and as you know, when we have expectations, disappointments, guaranteed will come. <laughs> so that's how we embroil ourselves in sufferings. Okay, double confirm. Personal field of experience that forms and perpetuates the ego. Okay, because I have this experience already and I keep saying, see, I'm right. I'm right about Julian. Not only I'm right about Julian, I am right. I am really good at meeting people. So you, all these experiences further perpetuate our ego or confirms our experience. How, if there is no me, how, who experiences this? Right? So because of all this experience, we reconfirm, double confirm that there is a me. I am right. I am experiencing Julian. I am experiencing the world, etc. So, because of all this perpetuation of views of, ex uh, of what we see, our I uh, view becomes stronger and stronger too. Okay? And the individual, this is what I like about Professor's uh, explanation. He says this, I remember it very well now. The individual becomes a victim of his or her own thoughts. Because reality is not like that. Reality just presents to us as is because of causes and conditions. They just come and present to us. But we don't stop at recognizing or just perceiving. We go on to conceptualize. And that's how we become victims of our thoughts because we, we rewire the experience okay, and link it to the past, link it to the present and link it to the future. And that's how we are controlled by this thought process. Because of uh, projection into the future, okay, we expect people to be in a certain way. We expect things to happen in a certain way because from experience what? And that's how when we are caught by surprise, we suffer. See, so this is the source of suffering. And that's why the whole chin chin long words about uh, beset the, uh, the man uh, in terms of past, present and future. So in short, this is what is happening. This is what is meant by how all these, our perceptual process, okay, is set and meant in terms of past, present, and future. Okay, so roughly this is how uh, Professor presented Mahakachana's explanation to us. And I think that is very helpful. So why is this perceptual process a source of suffering? After listening to all this, okay, we have to pause and think, okay, Maybe uh, system name doesn't make that very much sense. <laughs> so, why, why is this a source of suffering? Okay, I suggest it's because it is our take of the story. In Julian's example, it's the rose. Okay, in my example, it's Julian himself. Okay, the story is just Julian appears in front of me, full, full stop. But Around this, I, I, I give more and more parts to the story. Okay, and then in the end, I end up with having expectations of Julian. The next time in future, Julian will still be as good to me. Mm -hmm. So when it doesn't happen, when one day Julian frowns at me, then I start to think, uh, or Julian speaks uh, less in, in a less friendly way to me, I start to think, ah. Uh, Julian, Julian isn't as good as before already, and I start to feel disappointed, etc. Okay, so it is all exaggerated and tainted by our schema. This is not even real. It's just imaginations. I imagine, I, I hope, I project Julian to be like that. Okay, so this is not even real. Now you're, are you getting what? My title is about how we create our virtual reality. The reality is Julian is five aggregates. 
appearing in front of me because of process impatience. But my virtual reality is Julian is a great Buddhist. Julian is a good guy. Okay. So I just now I was telling you about the contact, two types of contact. Now, mentioned in the Diga Nikaya Sutta number 15, Maha Nidana Sutta. According to Bhikkhu Bodhi, Venobo Bhikkhu Bodhi, this concept of two types of contact is very unique to Maha Nidana Sutta only. Okay? These two types is vaccination contact, which is called Adivacana Sampasa, and impingement contact, Padika Sampacha. Now, impingement contact is just the eye meets the object and consciousness arises, con and the meeting of the three is contact. That's called sensual, sensual contact or impingement contact. That's very easy. After that, when we start to give sanya, start to label things, that is vaccination contact, adivacana sampasa. And that is when a perception turns into a concept and language is involved. Okay? So once, just now we have mentioned already, once you start to label something, once you start to use language, we impose another limitation on the objective reality. And so this is just uh, to explain further using Mahanidana Sutta on two types of contact okay, of the perceptual process mentioned in Maha, uh, sorry, mentioned in the Madhupindika. Can you get it? Am I too fast? Okay. Right. <sighs> I'm sorry. I'm just trying to link up all these things so that maybe you have an idea how Buddhism is actually an organic uh, whole, you know. Nothing comes up from the uh, vacuum. All these things that we, we discuss. Here we see that in Tsongkhapa's and interpretation of Nabarjuna's emptiness. Tsongkhapa is a Tibetan, uh, 13th, 12th century Tibetan, okay? And he interprets Nagarjuna's emptiness in this way, called the Prasangika set. Okay. What is interesting is he says, emptiness means nothing exists on its own naturally. And there is, of course, Patitya Samupada, interdependence. Okay. And name concept. He says, without a mind, without consciousness, and the consciousness giving names and concepts, Okay, to the objective reality outside, okay, the object would not would not be perceived, would not be understood by us. Hence, uh, something exists not only through causes and conditions, but also through the process of a consciousness perceiving it and labeling naming it for, their, for our own understanding. So on two parts, on two, two counts, an object is interdependent to other things. Okay, one is its own causes and conditions and one on the subjective uh, perception of it. And so everything is empty in these two ways. Okay, this is at least the Prasankika Tsongkhapa's uh, understanding of emptiness, okay? Then we also have Yogacara. Yogacara also tried to explain to us how we distort reality. Okay, in I think Manheng would know this very well, a rope in darkness. You heard that before? Now someone someone has seen a snake and got terrified by a snake. So the next time he saw a rope in the darkness, he immediately he thought this is a snake. Without even you know any further uh, investigation, he immediately thought that ah, it's a snake because he saw something similar to the shape of a snake in darkness. Now, this is a very classic case of how we interpret. Okay, but of course, Yogacara would want to add further uh, explanations to this rope in darkness uh, example. But I think we can use this to to explain Madhupindika as well. Okay, and also the stream. The example or the allegory of the stream in Yogacara, they were trying to tell us that different sentient beings will perceive the same thing differently based on our own uh, seats, the karmic seats in, 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 the, in the Alaya Vijnana, and at the same time, and also because of our karma. For example, human beings, when we see a river 
or a stream, we will see that as water. For a deva, because they have better uh, 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 karma, they will see it as what? A river of gems. But for hungry ghosts, they will see the river as full of pus and blood, okay? etc. So the same stream appearing to different types of sentient beings will be a different thing. So again, it has gone through perception, labeling, conceptualization, and also because of karmic uh, energies. And that's why we see things so differently, although it's the same thing. Okay, so in modern terms, we would say that we superimpose our schema upon the reality just perceived. What is schema? Okay, so in, in so doing, we create a virtual world of our own. So immediately I think of Yichie Wei Xin Zhao from these examples, and how we, how we interpret uh, the same information among the, the, the 15 or 16 of us, okay? We are already creating our own world. Let's say all of us are looking at Julian now. <laughs> all 15 of us will probably have different experiences with Julian and we interpret him differently. And so we create something, a, a story about him in our own world, our own virtual world. And that's how we interact with him differently based on our inter based on our, our experiences or projection of him. Okay, so this is, when we look at Yixing, Yixie Wei Xin Zhao, we usually think, it in, think of it in a very mystical way, right? But actually it is very down to earth. This is, it's truth. It's not like we, we, we create magic in our mind about the world outside. No, it is not magic. It is all mismatch of ideas, concepts, experiences, which may not be true. Okay. And just now I've been repeating things like schema. What is schema? Correct me if I'm wrong, huh? Okay. In psychology, schema is a way a person interprets situations based on his life experiences stored in his memory. Okay, uh, our cultural background, our education, our language, our uh, experiences, all these form the schema. And that's how we, how we interpret things outside based on this scaffold of um, concepts. Okay. So all these explain, explanations of the Buddhist abstruse words, okay, is centered upon the attachment to our views being real. I see a real Julian and he really is really that good, <laughs> etc. And I attach to my views to be real because I experience him as real. And so my interpretations of him are real and just. Okay. So we interpret reality based on our greed, anger, delusion, based on our limitations. Okay. And because of all these limitations, lead to quarrels, fights, wars, and destruction. Internecine destruction means both of us die. <laughs> okay, but how? Say, I, I say Julian is so good. Man Hing will say, no, la, Julian is lousy. Then I'll insist, no, how can you say that? Julian is so good. I'll give examples of how good he is. Then Man Hing will say, yeah, you won't see that side. Ma. I see a worse side. Da, da, da. So if we are lesser beings, we will start quarreling. Okay, if quarrel is not enough, you we'll still start to I start to give uh Manting a punch on the face. And because it's so painful, Manting will start to fight with me too. Okay. And and then we involve the whole BDMS, those who side with me, those who side with Manting. <laughs> and then we start to have fights. And then we have our we'll involve our neighbors, involve our friends. And so we become soon in Singapore, they become there come to be two factions over Julian, fighting over Julian. And that's how we have wars. <laughs> just as, as such, exaggerating a bit, but that's how wars start, right? And in all these, we call it dukkha. Whether it is personal level dukkha, or social level dukkha, or international level dukkha. And all these, is just starting from the satisfactoriness, and then from on to mental pain and physical pain. So if nothing is found there to delight and welcome and hold on to, this is the end of an underlying tendency to last aversion and ignorance. Once you see for yourself, 
all this start from my likes and dislikes. All this start from my attraction to Julian. And then I start to feel good. I start to want to cling on to this good feeling. Okay. And I start to get upset with people who don't agree with me. Okay. And that's how this uh, suffering start. So when I can see that all this suffering start with my unreal attachment to my own views, and we start to know that actually there's nothing to delight in. Okay, or welcome or hold on to. It's all just my interpretation, wrongly or rightly. Finish the stop. We now understand the Buddha actually meant that we are only interested in ourselves. You think I'm really that interested in Julian being a good man? No. I'm interested in Julian being a good man because of myself. That Julian will be a good man to me. He will help me. He will support me. I'm happy when I am with him. Full stop. And I want to re want to reconfirm my view that ah, uh, I'm very good at Okay, all I think about Julian is right. So when it is proven right, I get very happy. If I'm proven wrong, I'll think ah, uh, only today lah. Maybe he's not in a good mood, or maybe uh, he's not in good health. That's why he's not treating me nice today. Okay, so I still want to cling on to my view. So you think I'm really interested in Julian being good man? Nah, it's all about me, 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 myself. See, back to our ignorance of clinging on to me, me, I, me, and mine. Okay, so now embedded in this explanation, ah, you excite all these academic disciplines. <laughs> <laughs> Once I presented Madhu Pindika to a batch of interfaith uh, people that come from a Christian background, a Muslim background, and then they were very excited after they heard Madhu Pindika. One of them actually came to say, I didn't know Buddhism talk about this kind of things. No? So they are excited because they come from different academics. Uh, so you talk to a neuropsychologist about this, he will have a lot to tell you and say, oh yeah, something similar, huh? Hey, yo, your Buddhists can talk about this as well. Huh? Okay, you can also have communication theory inside this multiple process. You can also have theory of language to the linguist to be interested to know this too, etc. Okay, so that's why it's so chin. Huh? <laughs> you still find it chin? I usually, when I, when I share Madhu Pindika, I usually play this game. But because now we can't play games since we're not together. Okay? It is this pass the message game. Have you played that before? Yeah, okay. The, for those who don't, don't really know what pass the message means, I mean, I will start to give, let's say, Julian a very simple message. And Julian's job is to transmit the message in exactly the same way as he heard it. And he'll pass it to Man Heng. And Man Heng is supposed to do the same thing exactly as what he heard, pass it on to Sister Annie. Sister Annie will pass exactly what she heard or she imagined she heard to Xian Lan, etc. Until all 15 of us heard the message and the last person will come back to tell me what my original message was. So what do you think the result would be? Would the original message be the same? It never was, almost always. The message comes back to be totally different from the original message. Why? <laughs> That's because along the way, we inserted our own interpretation what we can remember, what, what catches our attention. Okay? And then we just thought, ah, that's the, that's the message and we pass it on. And when each and every one of us does the same, the original message will be distorted. Just like in Madhu Pindika, the whole perceptual process got the, the image, the original image of Rose or the original image of Julian got distorted because of my interpretation, because of all my extra sources. Okay. Until you, when you come back, Julian isn't just Julian. He has got an aura around him or things like that. 
So this pass the message game is a very good illustration for uh, the public, how we distort reality. And I don't know if this will be difficult, but I prepared this very hilarious uh, video clip to again uh, reinforce my, my, my point. What did you think to hear afterwards? Uh, what was the sound in reality? Okay, let me try to share this. You have to. Yeah, I came out. Sound, yeah, the sound. Yeah. Share sound also. Good. Thank you for reminding me. That. Okay, can you see it? Can you see that? Okay, great. Maintenant, c'est insupportable. Okay. So, what did you think you shared before you see the final scene? We all thought, right, the hippo was so very rude, right, to do to break wind in front of the poor dog. And the dog got get more and more upset the more the hippo did it right? until he went over and see the hippo wasn't breaking wind the hippo was just uh, deflating some balloons now can you see what i'm trying to bring out from this it's not me seeing that we distort reality when we hear something we also start to label or we start to superimpose our understanding of the sound and that's how reality gets distorted too. Okay, this is important in our daily life. A lot of times when we hear people say something, before we even get to the meaning of, the actual meaning of what the words were spoken, we are already based on our understanding of that person or the, the experience with that person, we start to reinterpret what he or she says. And depending on whether he or she is in your good books, you would interpret it in a positive or negative way. And that's how we start to fight. Because even a very neutral thing like, 你吃饱了吗? If I am a bad person to you, you would probably interpret it as, oh, she's mocking me. 你吃饱了吗? 你很穷,你没有钱吃饭,你吃饱了吗? Okay, or if you think I'm a very nice person, when I just simply say, you think that I have so much concern for you, you know, so much kindness, so much love in my, in my tone of voice when I say this. But in actual fact, I didn't. I just say, can you see that? So a lot of times what we see, what we hear, what we sense, we, we don't stop at the reality. We already start to label them once we come in contact with them. And that's how... Well, because we distort reality and the other party who perceives the same thing has another reality, so-called reality. So we don't see eye to eye, we don't see the same thing and start, we start to have doubts about each one another or start to, start to uh, uh, get, in, get attached to our views and start to argue. Okay, so what can we do about it? Madhupindika is not just the chimologic things that we have to memorize. We really want to learn from the, this teaching and what can we do about this distortion of perception, distortion of reality. So on the interpersonal level, I suggest perhaps every time we communicate or receive new information, we try not to JTC yet. What is JTC? Jump to conclusion, nah, not Jurong, what Jurong Town Council. <laughs> no, this is not, don't jump to conclusion yet. Okay, and we need to investigate. So, but when we try to investigate, we first must try to remember not to JTC. But how? Most of the time, yeah, Dhamma is so good, we learn so much. But every time I get angry, yeah, I can't remember the Dhamma, or I can't remember the Dhamma fast enough to stop me from getting angry. Why? Huh? 
I think a lot of us who this have this kind of uh, dejection, right? We learn so much Dhamma, but how come uh, it never helped me to to hold in my anger or hold in my my my, my sadness? How come? Okay, I think it's we have to pause and reflect time and again so that we can we can progress in our spiritual path. Okay, so 10 over 20 years we have been studying the Dhamma. How come we never seem to get happier or get better in, in, in holding our anger or, or have less suffering? How come? Where has the Dhamma gone? So, or is it Dhamma cannot help us at all? No. It's because we are not mindful enough. We have heard all the Dhamma, all the good Dhamma. Yeah, we remember. Okay? But we are not mindful. That's why we cannot remember. In, in, in Pali, the word for mindfulness is Sati. And one of the meanings of Sati is to remember. Okay? So... Because, as you know, we can practice samatha and vipassana, the meditation. So, but all these, if you are just good in, in sitting <laughs> on the cushion for one, two hours, but you haven't internalized the, the remembering part, the remembering expect is not, it's not uh, reinforced. Okay? It's not going to help a lot. So Sayadaw Tejaniya has told us awareness is not enough. Okay. And that, like I said, like, all this sounds very good, uh, but when situations arise, our understanding will be put to test. Okay. Let me share with you the uh, encounter with ghosts. <laughs> I think all of us like ghost stories, right? I wanna, why do I want to tell you this ghost story? to illustrate this point. It happens to me personally. Many years ago, I, I did my first uh, Goenka. You know Goenka, right? He teaches mindfulness on Vedana. So I, I, I did my first uh, retreat, 10 days retreat in, in, in Malaysia. That place was really good. I have got my own kuti with the bathroom attached. So yeah. That, and, and I had a very good meditation retreat at the time. So the last night, on the last night of the retreat, okay, went to bed and the window was just on, on, not up on my, at my head level. So I know I was falling asleep. Then suddenly I heard a dog shifting like, <laughs> like that outside. I, instinctively, I thought, ah, it's a dog. Then the next thought was, oh dear, the dog is going to do something to my slippers because I left my slippers outside the door. The next thing I heard is a woman sobbing. And then for the next few minutes, I hear, uh, you know, between a dog howling and a woman sobbing, you know, it just comes together. Once it will be the dog howling, then the woman will wail. Then the woman, after the woman wailing, the dog will howl. And it starts to get softer or sometimes it becomes louder. Okay. And then after some time, I just fell asleep. I don't even know what was happening. I just fell asleep. I thought, I didn't find, I didn't even think that it was funny that a, a woman should wail at that hour. So I slept. Next morning, we had a discussion before we left that, that place. And people said, did you hear that last night? And then I pricked my ears and listened, heard what? Apparently, I was not the only one who heard that. Okay, and so they started saying, this is what we call Hui Ku Lai. Okay, Hui Zai Ku. So if it's loud, that means it's very far away from you. If it's very soft, that means it's very near you. I was like, it spoke me. So I had this, remember I told you, right? That night when I heard this thing, nothing came to my mind. But the next morning when I heard what people said that sound was, I started to feel very frightened. And so in 2019, I went to I went for another retreat, okay, in Chiang Mai. Again, I slept alone. Now this experience came back to me. 
I start to, when I slept, I start to prick my ears because Chiang Mai, that, that meditation center was remote area. So there are a lot of wild dogs, okay, stray dogs. So they will start to howl at night. So when they howl, I start to think, oh no, is it coming? And I start to listen out to see if I can hear a woman wailing. So it got so bad, I got so frightened. The next morning, I went to the Ajahn who conducted the, the meditation. Okay, so I told him I had this bad experience and I was very afraid that I may be hearing the ghost called crying again. Now, Ajahn was very direct. He actually chided me. Okay, Ajahn Chagino. He said, Go anchor taught mindfulness on Vedana. How come you did not know how to use it? I was like, ah, what? I have been, I have done a very good retreat, you know. I, 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 I could practice the Vedana mindfulness very well. What do you mean by I don't know how to use it? Okay, so he, because he spoke in Chinese, this is what he actually said. I, I took down notes. He said, Gan Shou means whatever you can see, see, see. Okay, you will have a feeling. You will have a feeling when you have a feeling. 有了分别,就会有喜物。有了喜物,就开始会做行为. But the little experience will give rise to Vedana. Vedana, once you have Vedana, you start to differentiate. Okay? And you start to have like or dislike, and you have actions. He said, I should stop at differentiating level. Whether it was a dog howling or a ghost yelling. Just know. Just know and see how your Vedana arises. And he said, but if I go on to like and dislike, that means go past differentiate and start to have like and dislike, concepts and thoughts will arise and this will give rise to fear. And that's why I got fearful. And that's why he chided me. How come you don't know how to use Vedana mindfulness? Because I was just good at going through what the whole process of being mindful about Vedana when I was seated on a cushion. In real life situations, I forgot. I forgot that every time I hear a dog howl, I have Vedana and I start to don't like. I start to say, this is dog howling. Next thing will happen is the ghost will cry. You see, I forgot all this. So it is all what Ajahn said. He didn't say it's Madhupindika, but the process he described wasn't that Madhupindika. See, it takes a good teacher to point out things to us in practice. So it is still useful, even though we may be, well, experts in, in, in Dharma Suttas already. It's still good to go for, to, to learn meditation and to have a good teacher to point things out. Like Ajahn Chagino had pointed out to me, what was the what was the mistake in my practice? Although I could sit in meditation for one, two hours, just observing Vedana, not moving. Oh, what's the big deal? In real life, I got so frightened by dogs howling and ghosts crying. So what's the big deal? What, how has Vedana mindfulness helped me to overcome my suffering? It hasn't. You see? So, so for sharing this ghost story with you, my whole point is how we can be very good in understanding the Dhamma, but we can't practice that in real life when situations arise. Why? Because the sati, the mindfulness, the, is not strong enough. The internalization is not strong enough. We're just about, you know, what we did so far, or for me, what I did so far was just sitting down there pretty, <laughs> trying to go through the motion, that's all. Okay, so Ajahn Chagi not really, you know, point out my mistake and I start to be more aware, okay, so this is how I can practice Madhupindika. That is how I can practice Vedana, uh, mindfulness. See? So don't give in to our thoughts. If I say that, does it mean that we cannot trust ourselves? No, not really. Our conclusion at the end of completed investigation, remember I say we have to investigate, right? Or completed communication. It's only a working hypothesis and, or a work in progress. We don't say final, this is final, this is the conclusion, I'm right, you're wrong. Or you are right, I'm wrong. There's no right or wrong. Everybody would just be 
trying to understand what is going on, how their how their mind works. So it's a working hypothesis or a work in progress. So how much can we trust that just at a surface level until we get deeper and as long as our communication or our investigation doesn't land us up in more attachment to views or in more uh, suffering. Okay, we just leave it as a working hypothesis. You still think it's too cheap? <laughs> we have no time. So I'll leave this to brother Julian and let you watch on your own, okay? And um, hopefully you can find in this clip, okay, some something similar similar to Mother Pindita. Actually, here they in the clip it shows us four ways to improve communication. Okay, but my last question after you watch this film, or you should ask yourself, how is this able to eradicate suffering and attain mindfulness? If you ask this of the four ways to communicate, I also want you to ask about Madhupindika. How does Madhupindika help us to eradicate suffering and attain happiness? If you still think four ways difficult to remember, <laughs> we think probably remember in all our communications of, with ourselves, we be patient and try to understand what's going on. What other people say, don't jump to conclusion and say, this bad woman say bad things. Maybe bad woman will say good things sometimes, <laughs> right? So we have to be patient and try to understand the content, the intent of the message and how we have distorted it, okay? So the next time we are bothered by emotions, thoughts, and views, remember, Madhupindika, just this, use this as a mantra, Madhupindika. <laughs> and then you try to remember, uh, Madhupindika says, we distort reality. Okay, we should start to reinvestigate. So which part have we distorted? Is it I give labels or is it because I base my views on past experiences with this person? But this person changed, right? The Buddha had been so good to us, taught us about impermanence. Things are impermanent. People also impermanent. Okay? Maybe one, I, I, I had a very bad experience with Man Heng one day, maybe because that day he was really, really stressed out. But doesn't mean that Man Heng is bad all the time. Man Heng is good. It's just that at that time, at that period, he happened to be very stressed out. So our communication was bad. But people change. I change too, right? I'm not good all the time. So remember this. So when we interact with one another, we will be less hurt and we will help less. This is at the interpersonal level, how we can also let go of our attachment and how we can be happier and suffer less, okay, to, to give less sufferings to other people as well. Okay, so remind ourselves, what I perceive may be only my own virtual reality. And we have to check whether our virtual reality is really reflecting of the truth or not. Okay, so Alanda was happy and grateful to have heard this discourse at the end of the discourse. So he said to the Buddha, he said, Venerable Sir, just like someone who's hungry gets to eat the honey ball, the Madhupindika, he will find it sweet and wonderfully delicious. So anyone with wisdom who recognizes the meaning of this scripture will find satisfaction and confidence of mind. Venerable Sir, what is the name of this discourse? Then the Buddha said, as to that Ananda, you may remember the Dhamma teaching as the honey ball discourse. And that's why this discourse is very chain discourse gets a very beautiful name, honey ball discourse. Okay, so may you always find honey ball moments in the Buddhist teachings. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you. I think the, the, the last second slide when you say uh, about the, you know, if a man is exhausted by hunger and weaknesses and will come upon the honey ball, where, wherever he will taste it, he will find a sweet, delectable flavor. Meaning yeah. that the, the honey ball is round. Man. So you can taste uh, it all different places. Man. Uh, so there are many different ways of looking at it. So when I actually um, uh, was uh, you know, asking you to prepare this, I mean, to, to give a presentation on this, someone right? asked me, honey ball again? Yeah. Honey today ball you again. give it a, a very 
different uh, take. So that's what the, 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 you know, the Ananda was saying. Wherever you taste it, this is round. Mm. Uh, you'll find a different take on the, on the sutta. Mm. And I think it's, uh, it's a very uh, good, um, uh, uh, you know, this, this, this sutta, it bears uh, scrutiny <clears throat> and uh, consideration again and again. That's why we uh, love the Pindika. Thank you. Let's uh, just go and, and, and taste Mother Pintika Sutta again and again and again. So then it will, it will enrich our spiritual path as well, and our spiritual practice as well. And please remember what Ajahn Chagino has taught me and chided me. <laughs> I'm sharing that with you. So everyone of you will be able to remind yourself, yeah, don't just think you sit there pretty and you got it. Nah, it's, it's really much, much deeper in, than, than just sitting in meditation. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Salud, salud. So, do we have questions? Yes, do we have time uh, we for the, yes, uh, yes, there is time. Okay. We shall um, open the, the, uh, to the floor hey, of questions. You can ask yourself. Don't give me two chim questions. Uh. <laughs> I'm not a mm. chim person. I'm not my sister Sylvia. I cannot answer chim questions. <laughs> can I start the, the ball rolling? Oh, sure. I always find it a bit um, uh, different. Uh. Mm. You see, we, we, uh, uh, on contact comes feelings, right? Mm. Then afterwards come labeling. I would have thought that, you know, the process would have been, you know, they, just feelings comes uh, um, sort of like immediately. Mm. But it seems that like there's no thought process, but we, we know something is pleasurable. Mm. Even, even without attaching a label to it. Uh, would you care to comment? You see, uh, last time I also had this thought, you know. <laughs> hmm. I was also think, hey, but Buddha may be wrong at this point. <laughs> <laughs> because well, it doesn't happen. <laughs> I mean, with contact comes feeling, no, leh. it's like after some time, then I start to have feeling, right? But then I, I read about, uh, a, I read a book and it mentioned about some neuropsychology thing. It talks about the reptile brain, but Manheng will tell me now, the reptile brain are the three types of brains is now uh, backdated. They now would rather talk about the brain as what, uh, growing together, right? It's not one layer after another, it's, it's, it's growing together. So, but when I first came in contact with the reptile brain, I was so excited. I was like, wow, oh, the Buddha was so right. Because in, in this call, was it DePaul or Paul? Dr. Paul, some, some name. Anyway, he had this uh, theory of the three layers of brain, the reptile brain, and then, and then the what, reptile brain, and then what else? Money, you want to, you want to unmute and then tell us? <laughs> anyway, the reptile brain is the, the most ancient brain that we have. All mammals will have, all reptiles will have. And then, it helps us to see something and then have this flight or fight uh, response. So it's feelings. Feelings, then you start to have fight or fight uh, uh, response. So I was like, yeah, then the Buddha was right, right? When we see something, it goes to the feelings first, the, limb, the, the reptile brain first. And then that's how we, we start to have responses. So, but later on, the... <laughs> Neuroscientists would, would they say, oh, this is this is this theory of a reptile brain is not quite right. Okay, still in probably in neuroscience, if we if we, if we try to explain it to, with science, the neuroscience people would say, okay, once we in the perception process, right, once we see something, then uh, all these uh, neurons in us will transform the data into some electrical charges. Okay, and then you go, this is the low level kind of, of mental activity. And then it will go on to the higher level for frontal lobe to start to say, okay, I, I like, I don't like, what is this? This is Julian, all this kind of higher level uh, mental activity. But the lower level activity will be just the perception and then neurons transfer it into the sensations first and then we start to have the higher order of mental activity using neuroscience now so but in our actual daily life acti uh, experiences we don't we don't feel it that way perhaps because it's so fast it happens fast enough to to let us bypass the actual sensation part 
but when we are aware of it, it we are already up to the, the, the labeling part already. And then because of the labels, you start to have likes and dislikes and all the other emotions coming up. So that's why I want to stress the feelings uh, in Buddhism, Vedana, it's not about emotions, it's about the sensation. So if you look at the sensation in this way, sensation being disagreeable, agreeable, or neutral. So it's possibly very roughly will, will be described by the neural, the neurons, okay, trans, transmitting electrical charges to our body or to our brain, so that the brain will start to have higher order uh, mental activities to go on. Okay, so the sensation would be that electrical charge, but I'm not saying it's exactly the same. So in, in, in biological terms, that happens first. The order is you perceive something, consciousness, and then you start to have sensation. Sensation is not feelings. I hope, yeah, this is my own take. La. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not into well, the first jhana, second jhana yet to be able to break down the whole perception process to so uh, subtle way so that I can I can I can say for sure oh it's like that only the Buddha went through that so that's why he could describe in that way mm. but that gives me a lot of uh, inspiration to want to go further into jhana <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you that was a, a, a good reply thank uh, you. any other the person uh, any audience yeah, don't audience? have to ask question now you can you can share your comments also uh. Can I, can I say, say something? Hey, sorry, Monica first. Hey, Mahi. Okay. 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 Ladies uh, anyway. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Sister Ming, can I, would you be able to explain what is the difference between uh, designation contact and impingement contact? Okay. <laughs> if I'm, I'm lousy and lazy, I'll say, go and read body, Biku body. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, vaccination contact is to do with language we we start to label. So we first we would have impingement contact or this essential impingement contact. Okay, that means the first stage when our eye sees something and eye consciousness arises. The, con the coming together of three is called contact. At this point, that contact will be called mm -hmm. impingement or essential impingement contact. Okay, okay, this is just uh, the the very physical aspect like. but when you have vaccination contact, that is mental already. Of course, this mental uh, contact cannot happen without the physical aspect. But sometimes it can happen without physical aspect as well. That means you hear me say something, right? And then you have a you have a concept inside your mind and you start to think about it, you start to label it. Okay? The labeling part will be called vaccination contact. Vaccination here means label, names. So you start to give names to whatever you perceive. Okay. Once you have names, you start to have labels. Like I've explained further just now, we start to limit the reality or we start to distort reality already. For example, I say cat. Now in Monica's mind, what do you have when I say cat? Meow. Meow. <laughs> you say meow. Okay. So when I give you a broad thing, a broad concept called cat, you have meow coming up. Okay. That pertains to the cat's ability to make a noise. But to, to ping ping or to, to manheng, cat. He may be, they may be thinking of white cat, black cat, short tail cat, long tail cat, or tiger, leopard, lions. See? So once we have this contact, this vaccination contact, cat is very broad, right? But we will limit it to whatever our experiences or our likes and dislikes come to us. Okay? Or let's say you see Brother Julian drawing a rose for us, that rose. What do you see, rose? We don't only see it as a red flower. We will start to say, oh, it's a beautiful flower or it's an ugly flower, it's a yucky flower, it's a dangerous flower. We start Very to have nice. adjectives. We start to have adjectives coming up. So the reality is of that rose is not just rose anymore. We start to design 
vaccinated with a lot of things. That's called vaccination contact. And that's when we start to distort reality further and further. So in Mahanidana Sutta, they're trying to show us how contact can, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, condition feelings. And how feelings are also uh, based on all these kind of vaccination contact, not only sensual intention contact. Okay, so it, that's, that's, that's how sad we <laughs> sentient beings are, right? As once, at once when we see something or we hear something or we come in contact with something, we start to distort. Mm, and if we don't have wisdom, the distortion can go very, very far. I mean, we will live in our virtual reality forever. If I say that, I hope you remember uh, that, that, that film, what's that thing about the, the Matrix? Mm. A lot of people think Matrix has a very heavy Buddhist undertone. Okay? So it's not exactly the same as Buddhist teachings, but it can illustrate the Buddhist understanding of virtual world really well. I hope I, missed, I, I explained your question. Okay. Hing, what do you have? Uh, well, I just want to say that uh, even for, I'm talking from a small psychology point of view. Um, what psychology? Uh, I'm talking from a psychological point of view. Okay, good. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, in, in, if we look at trauma, for example, because trauma. In, in extreme situation, Mm -hmm. let, 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 let's say we meet a very uh, uh, dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. You realize that the, our feelings come first, mm -hmm. and, that's, and and that's the reason why the the, the reptile brain, like what you say, will be we will go back to the reptile brain that, mm -hmm. that works very hard. Mm -hmm. The reptile brain will tell you quickly freeze, fright, or fright. Mm -hmm. There are three responses. Mm. So depending on, uh, on the individual, they will have one of these uh, reactions. Mm. Then, then the, the brain will go to the uh, prefrontal contact and the feeling, the actual emotions will come. Then the, the, the brain will tell you, you know, what, what else to do. Mm -hmm. This happens in split seconds. So if you look at this just psychologically, and what the Buddha says, is very close. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's why I don't talk to him now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so the my 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 point is uh uh, it's because in normal days we don't pay attention, but in extreme situation you realize that you no, know, this thing actually happens. <laughs> <laughs> but if you practice, like, don't practice. Also, it comes in the blur. <laughs> yeah, you just scream. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> if if you if we practice, we might be able to see more clearly. But uh, otherwise, so in extreme situation, this happens and you read up knowing it is happening but you will look it from outside you will be able to see very clearly yeah. yeah yeah i can share one experience right about cockroaches <laughs> i fear cockroaches to like <laughs> once i see a cockroach i'll just scream and run away but now after practicing right i'm proud at least to say that when i see cockroach i take a deep breath <sighs> <laughs> and, I, and I won't have to, you know, immediately scream or run away. I just take a deep breath and, and look, at, look at the cockroach calmly and then think of what I can do the next. Yeah. So at least Buddhist practice had helped me in this way. <laughs> okay. I think this one is like over discussed already. <laughs> All of us are very diam diam, no question to ask. <laughs> Never mind, don't ask questions. Just just share your experiences with us or your practice based on you know, meditation or Mother Gundaka, how it had helped you. Or even answer the question of how Mother Gundaka can can help to eradicate our suffering. This is important because don't just keep listening to Dharma talks. We have to take something away from the Dharma talk and, and you know use it in our daily life. That's how Dharma comes alive for us. It's not like until trauma the show I like I like hey, what the Dharma say what the Dharma say a bit too late. <laughs> no ah, uh, don't wanna. Okay ah, uh, one. I count to three ah, uh, and then we can close <laughs> the session uh. <laughs> So we don't waste time uh, waiting for each other, my right? Hmm. Julian, you have something to say ah. Uh? Uh, oh, okay. One, two, three. Yeah, yeah. Two, yeah. yeah, if not, then I say something. Like, uh, okay, good. Uh, yeah. So the thing is, I, I think this this also um, 
kind of uh, help us to to kind of uh, see how we are approach to do the dharma because a lot of times uh, we have our own perception of what a dharma is mm. and we we keep looking for things that fit into my, my formula i will go mm. right yeah. sure huh? Mm-hmm. And uh, we don't see it from other angles, and I I I I like the simile of the elephant because the the dharma you know, we have, we can look at it the different angle, and it seems different, but actually we're looking at the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I tried that day too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In my academic studies, right? I know how sometimes we are into specialization. Like I specialize in sarvastivada, so you know emotionally you get. A bit attached to Savasivadin view, right? Yeah. So now what I do is to challenge myself, go back to Madhyamaka, see how Madhyamaka look at Savasivada. Yeah. And then sometimes it's like I would tell myself, eh, no le, Savasivada, don't say like that le. You know. <laughs> so so Madhupindika is useful just to check my views yeah. and be really objective about it. You know, like because I study Savasivada, so Indian Tao, you know, Savasivada are like, always doing. Or Madhyamaka always true, or your gachara yong yen chuo. I would learn from all three sets yeah. and see, yeah, actually the difference in views, you know, is because of difference in in, in stance in, in the in the in the angle they look at the Buddhist teachings. Interpretation yeah. also. Yeah. So do I blame them for all these kind of interpretations? I don't. Because of Madhupindika, I understand already. People have different interpretations of the Buddhist teaching because of their background, you know, the schema. Mm-hmm. So as a Buddhist, what do I do? I so many things to learn. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot be like, learn all three of Sarvasivada, Madhamaka, Yogachara, and what, what Chara Chara, all the Yana and Vadas. <laughs> How? <laughs> can, I, can I add something here? Yeah? yeah. Actually, actually the, uh, you know, the, in Chinese, there, there's always this, this, this word, huh? Mm. Uh, for, or for mm. uh, one is uh, emulate the Buddha uh, yeah. and all that. one is you know study about it you know academic knowledge uh. so I think uh, what is important here the Mahu is that uh, he's talking about something which someone without knowledge of any of the others uh, once they look at themselves uh, they are able to verify mm. that this is happening in my mind and, and from there come to understand that uh, we are controlled by our thoughts right. you know, especially our views uh, uh, so it's uh, me, mine, uh, and you know, and what I, what I owe and all these things. So um, with this, uh, you, you, if you look at the, 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 the early uh, Buddhists, uh, they probably, for, for example, someone who comes to the Buddha and then you know, gets enlightened, you know, maybe no, no academic knowledge at all. But using these principles and uh, they study the mind, you know, and they always say, you know, I go to into retreat after a while, you know, because I apply my 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 energy and everything, you know, I can say, you know, this life is done. You know, there's nothing else. Oh, oh okay. You know, mm-hmm. you know, so they become enlightened. Uh-uh. So so this whole pinnacle is something that even without all this extra uh, you know classification and all that, we just look at our mind. And we can see that this process actually is going on in our mind. Yeah, true. But at the same time, if you look at uh, the other academic views, right? It mm. also helped to broaden my mind. Yes. In the yes. sense that I start to understand how other human beings think. Yes. Yeah, and, and also don't be attached to my own views. La. It's always challenging my own views too. Mm. All right. So, yeah. Yeah, so I, like, you know, when you say, uh, yeah. uh, it opens a new, new yeah. uh, uh, what you call, new look. La. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I think the worst thing is you know when people's views differ from us, we start get agitated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I learned now not to. You know, I don't have to because they have their own point. <coughs> they have their own point. <coughs> so I appreciate the different kinds of views in Buddhism. So I I always tell my students now, you know, Buddhism is like a a, a lamb you know shattered into a thousand pieces after the Buddhist Parinibbana. And each sect or each vada, each yana picks up only one piece of that glass shard. It's not the whole picture. It's not the whole, not the whole lamb. So we have to <coughs> learn all these shards, right? And then the whole lamb will be pieced together, and we can see what the Buddha Dhamma is all about. And so I learn not to be attached to any vada or yana. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember. I remember the Bante Dhamma Jyoti uh, mm. mentioned the other day. Uh, 
last last few months. Uh. Mm. He say he said that no now he also forgot you no know, he belongs to which father. <laughs> Because he, uh, he started off as a, he said he started off as a Mayana monk, then he later, he went to for ordination with the Theravada, uh -huh. right? Then he learned all the Bali, uh -huh. right? Then then later he learned Sabasthivada, then he uh -huh. learned, now, now he also expert in uh, Yogacara also, uh -huh. right? So the thing is that he said he also uh, don't know which Bada he belongs to, but, but he said each, each uh, uh, Bada will give a different anger looking mm -hmm. at the dharma and it, it kind of complete the pictures yeah. mm -hmm. so coming back to our mama Dubin Tika, yeah. yeah it really keeps reminding us that not to attach to views yeah. feelings yeah. sensations whatever once there's attachment there will be suffering mm -hmm. the easier said than done nah. but the next best thing we can do is once we suffer we will think what did i do wrong <laughs> what am i attached to yeah, so this is a trace back law, deconstruct. Mm. Yeah, okay. okay. About that. The question is that uh, wherever Vada it is, we are all Buddhist. Yeah, we are learning with all disciples of the Buddha, we're learning learning from him. He's our greatest teacher. <laughs> okay, I yeah. think we come to the close of the session.